Good morning, everybody. We're afternoon on the East Coast. We're back with another edition of Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And in this session, let me just get my screens organized properly. I am pleased to be joined by two members of the cytokinetics team now, but names familiar to many in the HCM community because, well, they were HCMA Recognized Center of Excellence directors independently, Dan Jacoby at Yale and Steve Heitner at Oregon Health Science Center in Oregon. And um, they left clinical practice mostly to go work in industry. And now we have them here to discuss the clinical trial result from Redwood HCM open label extension. So I will go by um, seniority at Cytokinetics and welcome Steve Heitner first. Steve, nice to have you with us. And you, Dan sir. Jacoby. Um, so I'm gonna give your fancy new titles, guys. Steve is the Vice President of Clinical Research, um, the area lead, and um, some other words. And Dan is a Senior Medical Director of Clinical and Clinical Research. So they are the guys who would know what's really going on with the development of a new drug for HCM, we hope, called Afficampton. So Steve, could you just kind of kick off and give us an idea of a, what you're doing now, and B, what this Redwood HCM study looked like. Uh, sure. So, um, well, what we're doing now is we are working um, as hard as we can um, together with our uh, investigators around the country and the world, actually, um, uh, to help bring this new drug to patients, uh, potentially. Um, and we are in the process of opening up new sites um, in North America and Europe, um, in Israel and in China for the phase three study. Um, and then hopefully we're going to start recruiting um, patients who meet the inclusion uh, and the exclusion criteria for the various trials that we're running so that they can potentially participate um, in, in what we're trying to do for patients around the world. Um, the uh, Redwood HCM open label extension um, really is a unique study in that it, what, it, what, it, what its intention is, is to provide patients who have participated in any of the Afficampton trials an opportunity to um, receive the drug Afficampton for a period of a, about five years. Um, as part of a long-term extension study. Um, and that's done in an open label fashion. What that really means is that um, everybody who enrolls in the study after participating in a parent study uh, will get Affy Campton without randomization and there is no placebo control in the study. It means that everybody who participates gets Affy Campton. Right? So in the original Redwood trial, that was a double-blind placebo control trial, correct? Well, that's a little bit of a, um, a nuanced answer. So the original trial um, is actually still ongoing. So we have um, four cohorts. So a cohort really is a group of patients. Um, and because Redwood HCM, the original trial, is uh, a phase two study, uh, what that means is we still try. We, we were still trying to figure out what the right dose for patients was. So we had the first cohort where we started on a lower dose of of um, Afikampton, um, and in that first cohort we had a placebo control, and then we did a second cohort, um, which was a slightly higher dose of Afikampton, and in that cohort we had a placebo control. By the end of the second cohort, we, we think we figured out what the right doses that we were gonna use um, in the future trials. Um, so we didn't think that we needed to do any more placebo control. Um, so we did a third cohort um, and that was actually presented um, at the Americans, uh, um, at the ACC meeting, the American College uh, of Cardiology meeting back in uh, March. And that included um, a group of patients who were receiving background therapy that included 
you know, the usual things like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, but they were also receiving disapyramide. So these are the, the patients that tend to be the most symptomatic and have the most difficult to treat um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction um, that is ref refractory to medicine. So this is people who, who for whatever reason, either cannot or, or don't want to um, have a septal reduction therapy surgery or alcohol ablation. Um, and in that cohort, we didn't, we didn't have uh, placebo control because we knew what doses we were using. Now there's one more cohort in Redwood, which is actually still ongoing. And though that's a cohort of patients who actually don't have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So these are non-obstructive HCM patients. And again, um, in that group of patients, uh, there is no um, placebo control because we know what dose we're using again. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a nuanced uh, answer, but that that's the the short the short story. Those nuances are important so that patients understand that this was not just let's throw a drug at somebody and see what happens. It was a thoughtful process. You learned more, you did more, you learned more, you did more, and now we're this is where we are. So this cohort for the um, long-term extension. So they came from cohorts one, two, and three, and then they went long-term? Okay. Exactly. And okay. actually, once the patients are finished with cohort four, they'll also be accepted into the long-term extension. And the same is true for the phase three study and any other future studies that we're planning on doing at cytokinetics um, you know, patients will filter through those studies into this larger long-term extension study. Okay. So what was the inclusion criteria to even be in any cohort of the study? What was the New York Heart Association class base? What was the ejection fraction requirement? And what was the gradient? Um, well, so because it's a long-term extension, it's a little bit different to your usual clinical trials in that really the main inclusion criteria was that you had to have completed the parent study. So you had to go through, uh, in this case, most of the patients went through cohorts one, two, and three in the Redwood HCM um, parent study. And then once the, the, those patients had finished that study, they were offered an opportunity to participate. Um, now, there were some exclusion criteria because we, we didn't want um, to put patients necessarily at risk if something had happened you know, during the parent study or during life or they had changed their minds or whatever. So you know, um, the first main uh, inclusion criteria was that you had to have finished the parent study. And then uh, the subsequent exclusion criteria were that you couldn't have had a problem that, uh, you know, you had a severe drop, drop in your rejection fraction, for example, or you had a surgery in the recent, uh, the interim, um, or um, you didn't want to participate, or you were planning on having uh, a family or something like that. Um, so those were the main exclusion criteria. Okay, so as a whole, um, for, for the main Redwood, they needed a gradient of over what to get into the trial? Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, for the parent study in Redwood HCM, basically people had to have a resting gradient of greater than uh, 30 um, and a provoked gradient of greater than 50 or a resting gradient of greater than 50. Um, and then in terms of the ejection fraction, you had to have an ejection fraction, <clears throat> excuse me, that was above normal, which is uh, greater than or equal to 55%. Okay. And they were symptomatic. So they were not yeah. New York Heart Association class, class one, they were twos and threes. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So these were pe people who had persistent symptoms, despite the background medical therapy that their doctors were already giving them. Okay, so now we know who we're talking about. This is the patients, and there were 38 of these people. Pause. Thank you to those 38 people who participated in the trial to this point. We appreciate you. Absolutely. So that's the shout out to the 38. Some of them may be listening. So 30 of them have gone through 12 weeks of open label, so they know they're taking this drug. They know what's happening. And they 
are reporting back. And 19 of these individuals have been on the drug for 24 weeks. What did we learn? Well, um, so again, I'd just like to kind of echo the gratitude that we have at Cytokinetics for those, um, those patients that have participated in the original trial and those that have decided to continue. Um, and, you know, really we have learned a lot uh, because of them. Um, so the first thing that we've learned is that Afikamton seems to be uh, doing what it's meant to for up to six months, um, this is the data that we've, so this is kind of a, a longer period of time. So, uh, you know, just to remind people, the original Redwood HCM trial um, was only a 10 week period of time when patients were exposed to Afikamton. So we didn't really know whether Afikamton would last, the therapeutic effect of Afikamton would last longer. We thought it would, but we didn't know that as a fact. Now we know it as a fact. You know, Afikamton is, uh, does what it's meant to do uh, for up to six months um, and hopefully longer. That's part of the, the purpose of the long-term extension. Uh, five years of data, we'll see how long um, uh, it, it, it lasts. And I'm sure, I'm sure I hope that it will uh, be effective throughout that period of time. Uh, number two, we learned that it was very effective at reducing gradients. Um, so uh, the, the patients who were on the study um, got their doses changed and adjusted according to the echocardiograms that they had along the way. Um, and those adjustments were actually done by their treating doctors, which was a little bit different than what we did in the parent study where it was, you know, because it was a blinded study the doctors couldn't actually make those adjustments themselves because they, they were unaware of whether their patient was receiving the active drug with a placebo. This so let study- me, let, me, let me pause on that one because that's an interesting feature that the clinician who would be an HCM expert in this case was able to look at the echo, see where the gradient was and see that, well, maybe they could use another two and a half milligrams or another five milligrams or whatever the dosing is and they could work towards symptom reduction in a personalized way, more like the real world experience that you would have in a clinic working with a patient. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because you know, really the, the philosophy that we have is that we wanna give people access to the, the lowest effective dose. You don't wanna give them you know, too much or too little, but you want to give them exactly the right dose, which is the lowest effective dose. And that is, is um, what seems to be uh, happening in, in, in this particular trial. And that, that lowest effective dose is determined by your treating doctor. And you did echoes at week two, four, and six, and then mm -hmm. quarterly to watch that gradient and that ejection fraction and make sure that the gradient is coming down enough and the ejection fraction isn't dropping too much. Exactly. The initial kind of two, four, six um, echoes every two weeks, um, really we're able to do that with this particular drug because, you know, the, the, the chemical properties, the way it was designed was, was such that you, you could reach the steady state, which is kind of the, the state in which the, the concentration of the medication in your bloodstream is steady. So it's not going up. Um, and it, it's not coming down. As long as you're taking your medication um, uh, every day, steady state occurs at about two weeks. So we know that if we measure um, any changes on the echocardiogram at that two week point, that's what they're going to be most likely. Um, and we can change the dose if necessary. Um, and because we were studying uh, four different doses, um, you know, five, 10, 15 and 20 milligram doses, uh, we uh, built into the protocol that people would come back every two weeks to allow people to uh, be titrated to that maximum dose if they needed to. Um, I will say though, because, you know, uh, because of the, the way that things were overlapped, uh, when we first started the Redwood HCM open label extension study, we actually didn't know um, whether the 20 milligram dose would be 
um, you know, safe and effective. Mm -hmm. So for the first few months of the study, patients were only allowed to titrate up to that maximum of 15 milligrams. Um, and there are some patients that we know that probably will benefit from the 20 milligram, and that's now available um, in, in the protocol as it is. We did a protocol amendment. So we changed the protocol to reflect the, the knowledge that we now have, that 20 milligrams is, is, is safe and effective. Um, and if you, if you qualify for that 20 milligram dose, you can come in and your doctor will get an echocardiogram and make the changes as appropriate. Are you finding that the dosing is related at all to body habit is gender? Are there any consistencies that you're seeing and who needs a higher dose? No, I mean, it's really interesting. You, uh, you know, everybody's different. You know, obviously we have different shapes and sizes of bodies, um, you know, different ethnicities and races and all of those sorts of things. None of those things seem to kind of say, well, you know, if you're um, a 40 year old woman who is 150 pounds, this is gonna be the right dose for you. Uh, that's not, not how it works. Each individual has a different dose, um, which is why uh, we, we have to have a relatively frequent look at what's going on up front. Um, but then uh, uh, what we're seeing, and this, this goes back to what your original question was, is once you're at that um, target dose, and your gradients are down um, and your ejection fraction is, is steady, people tend to stay on that dose um, for at least a six month period that we've been um, tracking this. Uh, I also will say that there are some patients that have gone beyond that six month period. Uh, we didn't report on that data because there aren't that many of them. Uh, and there needs to be like a critical mass of, of people at a particular point that we can kind of say from a statistical standpoint that things are looking good. Fantastic. So we've seen at 12 weeks, a reduction in gradient of 28 millimeters of mercury. And at 24 weeks, 32 millimeters of mercury. So for baseline, they had to be at 50 to start. We're cutting gradients in half or more which then brings them typically down into an area where they may not have symptoms related to obstruction any longer. Is that the hope of what we're, we're trying to do here? Yeah, and that, that is the hope. Um, you know, the one thing I will caution people uh, who are watching or listening um, to this is, is, you know, those are averages. So there are some people who have less of a reduction um, and there are some people who have more of a numeric reduction. But that's really because, um, you know, if you imagine that you might be a patient who has uh, a resting gradient of 30 and a, uh, a provoked gradient using the Valsalva maneuver, of, let's say, I don't know, 55, um, and we, we start you on a low dose of um, Afikamton and those gradients go below that threshold of 30 and 50, then you're only going to have like a five point reduction in your resting and maybe a 10 point reduction in your uh, your Valsalva gradient, whereas somebody who starts with much, much higher gradients is going to have a much bigger drop. Um, so the way that I would, uh, I would advise people to think about this is um, almost all of the people that were treated um, in, in Redwood Cohort 2 achieved the target of becoming a hemodynamic responder. And what that means is those people crossed that threshold and are no longer considered, um, you know, to have severe obstruction, um, and you know, traditionally wouldn't be offered things like septal reduction therapy because they wouldn't qualify anymore. Um, and in the open label extension, we're seeing, um, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, all the way out to 24 weeks. The average um, reduction puts the average person below both of those thresholds also. So I'm looking through the press release here and I'm trying to put numbers onto things so people can get real world experience here. So of the 19 individuals who did 24 weeks, 56% of them were in class one by, the, by 24 weeks mm -hmm. and 39% were in class two. They all started in twos and threes. You didn't have any fours here, right? 
No, there were no four. No four. four patients. So people are improving by imp the improvement in New York Heart Association class, which we know can be quite variable in HCM. So it may not be the perfect measurement, but it's a good indicator. People are improving by a class. And so the EF changed by about 4% on average at that 24 week period. So putting your clinician hat on, what does this say about the success of what we're seeing here from what patients would be expecting if we were able to get them on this drug? Um, well, I mean, I think the short answer is that it's amazing. Um, it really is um, uh, incredible to see that not only are we able to fix a problem that you can see on an echocardiogram, that's one thing, but the most important thing is that 80% of the people that we treated, eight out of 10 people, reported feeling significantly better. You know, I mean, that's, that's the whole purpose over here is to relieve um, the obstruction and to alleviate suffering. You know, people are, are suffering um, and frustrated with these, these symptoms. And what we're seeing from open label extension over here is that 80% of them, 78% if you want to be um, exact, uh, reported um, improving their functional capacity. Um, and actually, you know, you, you brought this up, more than half of those people said that they actually were asymptomatic. They had no symptoms, no functional uh, limitations. Um, limitations. That's pretty amazing to go from symptomatic HCM to non-symptomatic obstructive HCM and cutting your obstruction down and cutting your disease burden. Like, I think we just need to take this moment and say, while I do not believe in, in the prior podcast, Harry Lever and I just discussed this, I don't believe that surgery is going away. I think there are some people who are going to need an additional therapy because a drug is not going to work for everybody and every anatomy may, may not respond in the same way. So surgeons, don't panic. I don't think we're putting you out of work yet. Uh, interventional cardiologists, there's probably going to still be a role for alcohol septal ablation. But to have a tool in the toolbox to be able to pull out and say, Let's see how you're doing here with, without obstruction. Is that really where your symptoms are coming from? Because there are a percentage of patients who go for surgery and they think that their symptoms are related to their obstruction and they come back and they don't feel so well. And they're a little disappointed that they went through an open heart procedure and they're still not feeling as well as they want to feel. Yeah. We'll know who the responders are gonna be because the obstruction is causing their symptoms if we're able to start with a drug that can get rid of it for most and try that first potentially before having somebody have to go through surgery. But I don't think we're gonna get rid of, like I said, I don't think we're gonna get rid of it completely. But I think we can limit the number of people who have to endure such an invasive procedure. So. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because, um, you know, when I was um, at the university, I used to use disapyramide a lot to do that. The only problem is that disapyramide, um, you know, obviously it has significant side effects, um, but it doesn't really work as um, reliably as these, these new uh, agents that we now have. Um, because pulling the trigger on a septal reduction uh, procedure is a, is a big deal. It's a big decision. And I always wanted to kind of know as best as I could, and I, it, wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but I always wanted to know that if I was making a recommendation to my patient, that that recommendation was based on as much, um, you know, information as I could possibly um, get. Yeah, absolutely. So what else do they need to know about the trial before we pitch to the next part of the conversation? Okay, well, um, I think that the other piece of information which is important is that, yes, we fixed what looked like was a problem on echocardiograms for most patients, um, and people tended to feel much better. Uh, but we also noticed that some of the, the blood tests that we do um, in order to kind of make scientific measurements um, of things like 
uh, wall stress, which is uh, a, a kind of, uh, it's a hormone that your heart secretes in, in times of stress and, and stretching. Uh, it's called NT pro BNP. And when those levels are, are, are going up, it means that your heart is, is unhappy, I guess. Um, and that went down by 70% um, at three months. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, there's another marker, cardiac troponin, high sensitivity troponin, which is a measurement of Traditionally, it's used to measure heart attacks. If you go to the ER with chest pain, they often would check it. Um, but the high sensitivity uh, measurement actually measures very kind of minute uh, damage to uh, heart muscle cells. It's very sensitive. Um, and when that level is up, it means that they, you know, the, I guess the, the heart cells aren't that happy either. Um, and it, it seems like Effie uh, Camden reduced that uh, level uh, by 20%. That was a significant reduction also. Um, and then I think that another very important um, aspect of this long-term extension is looking at the safety. So it's very nice to kind of show that the, the drug is effective and it, it does all these nice things, but it also really has to be um, safe. Um, we wouldn't want patients to be taking a drug which is not safe. Um, and I will say that uh, the safety profile that we've got from, you know, these 38 patients does seem to be very encouraging. Um, and the one that everybody really um, worries about is whether we could result, we could drop the ejection fraction too much. Um, and I will say that in the, uh, um, you know, the, the 40 or so patients that we've had um, up to the, the six month period, there was one individual who, who did um, have a, a problem with ejection fraction. Um, I, I will say it wasn't really, um, the investigator felt that it wasn't because of the medication. Uh, uh, this uh, individual uh, dropped their ejection fraction to just below 50%. Um, in the setting of a, an episode of atrial fibrillation uh, that, was in the past, you know, the, the person had a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that came and went. And in the past, um, the e ejection fraction had dropped below that 50% point with an episode of atrial fibrillation before that even had afficantin. Right. The same thing happened while they were on the study. Um, that person is now back on afficantin uh, without any um, issues whatsoever. Um, and really, you know, that was the only kind of um, uh, issue that I thought that we should talk about now. There were no other um, concerns for those, for those patients. Um, importantly, there's only 50 pa patients or so that are on the study um, right now. So we are obviously monitoring this and hope, hopefully things will stay as, as good as we're seeing them, but, you know, time will tell. So you brought up some really good points about, you know, some of the biomarkers that we use, BNP and troponin. Um, troponin is always a, a confusing factor in HCM because patients end up in the emergency room. Oh, you have a slightly elevated troponin, you must be having a heart attack. And it's like, no, they have HCM and their heart is under stress right now. And it's a different mechanism that causes the troponin release. Um, but it is an important marker because we know high levels of troponin mean heart damage. So we don't want that. So to see a 20% reduction, that's really encouraging. And to see a 70% drop in BNP, that's literally taking somebody from being an active heart failure to not being in heart failure. And I don't know that patients really understand that that BNP number is very closely related to those symptoms of heart failure in HCM. So by a 70% reduction, like if I could bold and put like exclamation points around my picture right now, I don't have that kind of technology. I'm not that cool. Um, but 70%, that's a big drop. So that's really, really encouraging. Now, I don't want to just look at the positive and everything's perfect. We know that these are powerful drugs. We know that they can drop the ejection fraction if not properly monitored. And we've seen in the other version of a myosin inhibitor that's all ready to market, that there's a REMS program specifically looking at, we're gonna keep doing echoes. We have to do serial echoes. We don't know enough about how these drugs are gonna act over time. So we're watching that really carefully because safety is the most important thing. 
you don't want to give up a gradient and go, yeah, I got rid of my gradient, but my ejection fraction is now 20% and I need an <laughs> urgent transplant because I'm screwed. So we want to balance that. And it comes with that extra imaging by a great center that knows how to look at that EF carefully. Would you agree? That's where we're going? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, Dan and, and myself were both very much involved in the Maverick Hampton de um, development program. And both of us were so happy um, when that drug was finally approved. Um, but I have to agree with you, Lisa, that, you know, um, I think that we need to kind of be careful um, up front. And this is not a situation where I believe that it should be a free for all and we, everybody should get Maverick Hampton. We need to kind of do this kind of slowly and judici judiciously because um, if we make any mistakes now, it could end up affecting um, you know, what happens in the future. Now, with that said, um, you know, Africa Hampton was, uh, was designed uh, chemically specifically to um, make it potentially a safer um, molecule. Um, it seems to be behaving in exactly the right, in exactly the way that we want it right now. But to your point, it is early days. Um, and the whole reason for having a long-term extension, uh, well, they're not the whole reason, a reason for having a long-term extension um, for up to five years is so that we can learn more about the safety, uh, what the cadence of that um, safety monitoring needs to be, whether it needs to be every three months or six months or 12 months, I don't know yet. Um, we want to make it as safe for people as possible, but also uh, re reduce the burden potentially um, of you know, having to go to the doctor for all of these things. And, and this is what this, this long-term extension study is going to teach us. The other thing I wanted to kind of quickly point out is that within the long-term extension uh, study, we've also got an MRI study. And this is a really, really important scientific um, aspect of the study, because we're hoping to learn not, not only about how Afikantin affects the heart, but we're hoping to learn about HCM itself, the actual mechanism of the disease, uh, what happens um, over time, how do we measure uh, the effects of having, say, for example, an elevated troponin that we were just talking about. I mean, what does that actually mean over a prolonged period of time? Um, so it's a very, very important part of our study. Um, and we're hoping to kind of, um, we, we understand that it is a burden uh, and we kind of relying on our patients again to kind of give up their valuable time and their bodies so that we can kind of get this information that hopefully will um, result in future benefits for all patients with, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in the MRI, <clears throat> for the purposes of the study, what are you trying to track and how often are you doing the MRIs? Okay, so um, it depends on where the patients are coming from. So for example, if they're coming through Dan's study, uh, which hopefully we'll, we'll get to in a minute, uh, with Sequoia HCM, they, uh, individuals will have an MRI at the beginning of that study and the end of the study, which is you know six months apart. Then in the open label extension, we're going to be essentially doing an MRI once um, a year or so, or once every two years um, for that period of um, five years. So we'll, we'll have about three MRIs in the, um, the open label extension, plus the previous one from the uh, initial study so it'll give us about, you know, maybe four or five MRIs throughout the period of that five-year period. Um, and, you know, I, I guess we'll be able to track uh, patients' um, progress over that, that long period of time. Don't you wish you had like a fast-forward button and you could just get to the five years and see what happens? Uh, trust me, yeah. And I mean, I think the things that we're looking at, so it's not just we're looking at pretty pictures because MRIs do give us very, very pretty pictures. Um, but they're very sophisticated ways of measuring um, what the actual makeup of the heart muscle is. So right. our hearts are made of obviously muscle cells and fibrous tissue. And then kind of the, um, we call it the extracellular volume, which is um, a matrix with you know collagen and all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and those sorts of um, uh, materials have an implication on the prognosis of an individual 
patients. So for example, somebody who has a high fibrosis burden um, tends to have a low, uh, I mean, a, a worse prognosis than somebody who has less uh, of a, a fibrosis burden. And what we're hoping to see is that not only do these drugs potentially um, improve people's uh, symptoms and all the biomarkers that we've been talking about, uh, hopefully they'll reduce the thickness of your heart, the, the hypertrophy, um, but also reduce the fibrosis burden, which in, in our minds would be um, you know, a, a true kind of a victory against HCM. Then I would buy the fancy software to put the explanation points around. <laughs> that's the that's the Mac Daddy win. If if yeah. if this if this does that, in five years we'll all be very happy people, um, because the community will be much better served. But it's it's a hope, and that's why we do clinical trials. So that was really really helpful. Um, we did have one question. Um, and I don't know if you have any data on this. Is there any indication that there's any positive effect on blood pressure for those with hypertension on top of HCM? Were there any changes? You know, that's a really, really good question. Um, and we have been talking about that internally. Um, so I, I guess the short answer is that we don't know yet uh, because there aren't enough patients for us to be able to kind of um, make any conclusions. Uh, but I will tell you that we are absolutely looking at that um, uh, because I think that, you know, that would be a really interesting uh, finding is, you know, if we reduce the gradients with this new medication, does it also result in kind of improvements uh, that people don't traditionally ascribe to having uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Okay, so I have my own protocol that I want to put together, just pitching a concept here. I'd love to see an exercise prescription given on top of this, once you get them to maximum dose to teach them how to exercise again, because a lot of people, when they have obstruction, they just become more sedentary. And even if the symptoms of obstruction goes away, it's kind of hard to bring them back to those good habits that they kind of put on the shelf for a while because they didn't feel safe exercising. So if we could get people to just start moving again, I think you would see BMI come down a little bit and maybe some of the hypertension go away because some of these patients have put a little extra weight on them. So I pitch that you guys fund an exercise prescription and help patients learn how to exercise again. And then you have a lifestyle modification on top of therapeutic and they work together. We'll just call it the Lisa trial. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I mean, you know, um, it's one thing to kind of just test the efficacy of the, of, of the drug, but also I guess like focusing more on, you know, the, the bigger picture. Uh, and, you know, if we could, if we could demonstrate that that was uh, additive, I guess, and there's an incremental benefit, mm -hmm. that would be fantastic. So, yeah. We'll talk about that offline. Right. Okay. So Dan's been sitting quietly and just listening and chiming Enjoying in a little bit. So Dan, you, you, you left, you left us uh, from, from Yale and you, you went to industry and now you get a clinical trial to run. So you're like all HCM all the time. See, I love this. When they, when they left their full-time gigs in clinical. I'm like, this is good for us. I like this. These are our guys. They're going to take care of us. So can you tell us a little bit about Sequoia? What is this trial? Where can people find out about it? And how can people enroll? So what's the design? Yeah, well, uh, actually, before I say that, let me just get back to kind of how you started, because you know, one of the things about HCM is it's a community. I mean, you know that more than anybody. It's not just a, not just a community of patients. It's a community of, of all the people who are interested in trying to, trying to help. And um, the, there's a provider and an investigator community also. And one of the things that's been really amazing is to discover that, you know, whether, whether working at an academic institution like Yale, working at Cytokinetics, um, myself and, and all of my colleagues, um, we're, our, our vision our vision and our mission has not changed and our friendships and goals and desire to help patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has not changed at all. Um, it's actually even more, I, I feel it even more intensely now. So I um, just wanted to make Good. that comment. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Works for us. So, <laughs> so Sequoia is, is the phase, what we call phase three. 
study for afficamptin. So the way these drug development studies go is you need phase one, which is sort of really just looking at how the drug works in normal people and figuring out some of the dosing and some of the potential effects, pharmacodynamic effects, the effects of the drug in relation to what it does to the patient in the safest possible way. And the phase two is what you were just talking about with Steve, as he explained it, dose finding, looking a little bit at efficacy, and you use that information to build your phase three study. And the phase three study is the, the randomized, usually randomized placebo controlled, long enough study to really determine whether the drug does something useful for people or not, and whether it does it safely. And if you do the trial right, and you get the result that you hope for, which you don't always get, then you can take that information along with the phase one and phase two and preclinical studies and bring it to the FDA and let everybody have a look at it and see if it looks like the kind of medication that should be available to patients to take. So that's what Sequoia is. <clears throat> Obviously, we're using California trees to name our studies, Redwood and Sequoia. And Sequoia is a 24-week treatment trial for patients with New York class two or class three, so patients with sort of mild or moderate symptoms, and the same kind of outflow obstruction that Steve described for Redwood. 30 at rest, 50 with provocation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah. Randomized to, eat, to, to one of four doses of afficamptin, five, 10, 15, or 20, versus placebo for 24 weeks. At the end of which, um, there's a brief period where you come off of what we call the investigational product. We don't know, wouldn't know, no one would know what they're on, so we call it investigational product. And after that, um, we hope that many patients will go into Redwood OLE as an opportunity to continue their treatment, this time with open label afficamptin. Question about the four dose options. Is everybody starting at the same dose and then the dose changes because you need to titrate up? This is a really great question. Um, and it's, it's something that we spend a lot of time on. It requires careful design. Uh, but yes, that's what happens. Patients all start um, on a, the same dose. If you're on placebo, it's placebo. If you're on afficamptin, it'll be five milligrams. And then after two weeks, an echocardiogram is done. And if the amount of gradient seen is greater than or equal to 30, and the ejection fraction is greater than or equal to 55, that patient is a candidate for increase because they okay. still technically qualify as having obstructive hyperdynamic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we think there's room for improvement with a higher dose. I'm going to ask you to define hyperdynamic to those who don't listen to Tales from the Heart all the time. Great. Um, so it goes back to sort of the basis of what we think of as the cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, there may be people listening who have a gene that causes their condition. There are probably people <clears throat> listening who don't have a known gene that causes their condition. But from, from knowing that some people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a gene and from knowing what those mutations are, scientists have been able to understand that the mechanism of disease is increased activity of the proteins that cause heart squeezing. And that increased squeezing we call hyperdynamic when you're talking about the whole heart. So whereas a normal sort of non-hyper, I won't call it normal, I'll say non-hypertrophic heart might have an ejection fraction of 55% on average, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart would be much more likely to have an ejection fraction greater than 65%, just at rest, not walking around, just sitting on the couch. There's a lot of things that stem from that, but one of the things is obstruction. And so getting rid of that high ejection fraction, a little bit, it only requires a little bit, can resolve that obstructive process. And that's, that's the mechanism of how this all works. Fantastic. Thank you. So patients in the Sequoia study um, will be on the, as you asked about the dose, 
will be able to go up each time they come in by two week periods up until they reach the point where they have a less than 30 millimeter gradient um, or less than 55 but greater than 50 ejection fraction. Um, and they can reach or they reach the end of dose titration, which would be 20 milligrams as the maximum dose. How, OK, so that's how we dose them and that's how you're imaging them. And they're imaged every two weeks with the yes, dose so change. Mm -hmm, exactly. The, it, you, Steve talked a little bit about the special nature of this molecule that it Afficampton, that it's specifically designed to this effect. So the half-life, the amount of time it takes for the drug to get out of the system, 50% of it to get out of the system is about three and a half days, which is significantly shorter than Mavicampton. It's um, not quite a third. It's a little bit more than a third the amount of time. So dosing becomes a little bit more specific and Come easier specific. to titrate up and down. Correct. As so needed. You move faster. Doesn't take a whole month to figure out what the dose should be. And when you need to go down on the dose, you can go down without stopping it because it washes out of the system faster. Gotcha. Okay. How are you measuring how somebody's doing? Are you using treadmill tests? Are you doing surveys? How are you determining improvements? Yeah, so that's, that's super great that you brought that up. Actually, we're doing both, to be honest, because we need to really assess the effect in all ways. But there's something in every clinical trial called the primary endpoint. And you have to get to the primary endpoint in order for a study to be positive or to show that it does its thing. And in this case, that's exercise test. That's metabolic exercise tests where you breathe in and out of the tube. A lovely mask. Everybody loves that test. I did it myself a couple of weeks ago for a test. Um, and um, after that, right after that, we have two very important endpoints. One of them is the KCCQ, which is Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, which is a very straightforward questionnaire that asks about a list of symptoms. It's mm -hmm. very, very well studied. And the other one is New York Heart Association. So one is what we call patient reported. That is the patient reports on the KCCQ, how they're feeling. We look at that as a patient opportunity for us to understand how the patient's feeling. And the other one is New York Heart, which is the physician or PA, whoever's taking care of it, says, oh, how are you feeling? You report it and then they grade you as one, two, three or four. Um, so those okay. are the criteria. Okay, I'll, I'll give you, I'm gonna pause the, the clinical trial on this. What I wish would be classified as well is stability in New York Heart Association class because we don't think of that as an important factor. However, with HCM, because we can have such variable symptoms, I think a, a stability of New York Heart Association class has value, maybe not equal to an improvement of a class, but it has value to the patient community to be stable and not worry that I'm a heart, New York Heart Association class two today, and I might be a three tomorrow because I did a lot of work today. Tomorrow might be bad. And that's how you live with HCM is trying to balance that. But to know that you can constantly be a two and understand what your reserve is and what you can do is valuable. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge, the patient community values stability. Just putting it out there. Maybe I'll jump in there and, and go back to the open label extension study. We did look at that actually. Um, so you know, maybe the patient community will appreciate this, that uh, um, everybody in the study um, either stayed stable or improved. There were no people who had um, uh, a worsening uh, of their New York Heart Association functional fast uh, in the study. There were uh, just a couple of patients who stayed stable and everybody else improved. Good. Okay, so back to Sequoia. So they're going to do the exercise test as an endpoint. Are there other endpoints? Yeah, so remember how Steve went through the MRI. Um, so we have a very big interest um, in helping patients in the community understand what the effect of these medications are on how the heart looks. So we're looking carefully at the echo over the course of the study. And actually, we have a, a large MRI study as part of this. I did get a question about MRI. Um, in the in this current trial and in the past, 
Does having an ICD impact your ability to be part of the MRI arm? So at this time, we have a protocol that does not allow for ICDs to be part of the MRI, for patients with ICDs to be part of the MRI study, because there are certain types of images that the MRI can't um, accurately get. Although you can get a clinical MRI, and it actually can be quite good with an ICD. For the purposes of the study, there are very specific parameters that need to be looked at in all the patients, and they're ve they become hard to look at in certain ICD patients. And just so unfortunately, to, not included. Just to give people who are listening an idea, you can have them safely now, MRIs with ICDs, yeah. but there tends to be, because you have this non-human piece of you, this device, and it's titanium, it, it gives like a washout, and you don't get those crisp images that you would for somebody without a device. So you can still qualify for the study, as I understand it, but you just wouldn't be in the MRI arm. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Absolutely, we want everybody to, uh, with obstructive HCM to be part of the study if they can. But the MRI substudy for research purposes, for research MRI, would not be able to get the data right. from if the ICD is there. So it would be kind of a waste. Um, Understood. Yeah. How many patients are you trying to recruit? 270 patients. So it's actually How many centers do you have? We have 100 centers. How many are in the United States? Over 50. And we're going to be dropping some information in the Facebook link where you can learn more about that trial. Um, and we will be keeping you in touch through HCMA on where to, to get access to that. Um, so inclusion criteria, if you want to join, there's obviously, you know, these page, these protocols are long and there's idiosyncrasies about, you know, if you're thinking about having a child during this time, you probably don't want to be in a clinical trial right now because that would not be good. But you need obstruction over 30 at rest or 50 with provocation or 50 at rest. You need to be symptomatic. You need to be willing to have how many visits over the 24 weeks? I should have had this wired. I'm not sure of the exact number. Steve, probably at least... Number? Probably what five or six visits. You're oh, on. You're on mute, Steve. That. It's a few more than that. Um, looking now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven visits over twenty over probably thirty to thirty-two weeks. Okay. So you're talking, you know, it's, some of them are more spread out. So later in the study, it's week 12, 16, 20, So every four weeks. Earlier in the study, it's you know day one, week two, week four. So that's more frequent early in the study. Kind of for obvious reasons. I mean, you're taking a potentially study drug. We need to monitor you more closely and change the dose and so on early on in the study. And the other thing I'd say about getting enrolled, you know, we have a lot of centers in the United States. And obviously, you know, Lisa will make sure that you're informed about where those centers are. Um, but, um, you know, one thing that's always useful is to just query your doctor. I'll advocate for patients to advocate for themselves, honestly. Um, to query your provider, your uh, your doctor or PA or whoever you're seeing about it, um, and ask, do I do I qualify for this? Because the opportunity to do a couple of things, I've always been so impressed by patients. What I've you know people ask, why do people participate in clinical trials? The number one reason people participate in clinical trials, from what I can see from my patients, is they want to help the world. Honestly, it has nothing to do. I'm amazed. It's not, what can I get out of it? How can I benefit? It's, let's make sure that the next generation of people has it better than me. That, would you agree with that as a general statement, Steve, Lisa? I've been that patient. I've been in trials. Um, probably you should sit down someday and write them all down. I've been in drug studies. I've been in um, pretty invasive clinical trials that required cardiac catheterizations, um, device therapy, different settings on my devices. Um, I've probably been in 15 different clinical trials in my life and multiple members of my family have been in multiple trials in their life. And some of it, I didn't notice anything positive or negative, but I did it and they got the data and we learned. I was in the spiralactone study. So like, 
what did we learn from that? Yeah, I had to have a couple of blood draws for the cause. There you go. Um, but being in a trial, <laughs> it's a little fun from a patient point of view because you get this different look at healthcare and it's like, okay, I'm not just being a user of the system. I'm being a contributor to science and you get to play, you know, patient scientist a little bit and be very pragmatic about what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. And, and you can communicate that to your coordinator. So it's documented well, and it can be, it can be interesting. Um, and it's, it does help others. And I didn't get to do a lot of the clinical trials for transplant because it happened before me. But the data that was collected and the patients who did that work were able to provide me with a better quality of life with easier anti-rejection management. So all the HCM stuff aside, like I've been in that forever, but you can't participate in a trial for a transplant until you're a transplant. So we all kind of pay it forward and we can all be a really important part of the process. And feedback matters as patients are in trials and they say, I really didn't like this, or this is a real problem, or this was a side effect. That gives everybody the opportunity to, to evaluate it, take corrective action, figure out the why. So when it goes out to the world, maybe everybody else won't have those same issues. The dose was too high, the dose was too low. You get to figure all that out. And I think it's exciting to be part of a clinical trial, but that's me. Maybe I'm a little bit, maybe I'm a science geek. I don't know. You know, I mean, you know, people like you, Lisa, and the, the, the patients that I've had that have participated, obviously, we were incredibly grateful. But, you know, to be completely frank, um, there is this kind of altruistic um, feeling about the whole thing. And I think that it's, it's, it's like everything that, that people do in their lives, which is for, for the betterment of others, it makes you feel good yourself. Um, but also, Part of the reason why we have access to the open label extension, it's not only science um, that we're interested in. We also want to give patients an opportunity for them to feel better. Um, and having access to a drug like Afficampton, which hopefully will result in long-term improvements, um, I think is, is, is very attractive uh, to patients. And we as a company um, understand and appreciate that and want to kind of honor that. Well, <clears throat> there's another part about being in a clinical trial, and that is being respected for your contributions. And the patients are compensated to some degree for their time and travel, and it shouldn't be a burden for a patient to participate. Yes, you have to give up your time because we need your heart in place at a time so we can take pictures of it, and we may need blood and other biomaterials, et cetera. So there is some inconvenience and a teensy amount of pain. It's an IV prick, it's, it's an echo, like we haven't done one of those before. Um, but there's, there's a back and forth here and patients are appreciated, which I think is important as well and respected. Dan, what else do they need to know about the trial? Um, I think we've covered most of the critical points. Um, it's a it's, you know, we're hoping to enroll most of the study by the end of the year and complete enrollment by, certainly by this time next year and maybe even earlier. Um, you said about, you know, can we fast forward five years? We want to do everything very conscientiously and correctly, uh, but we also want to do it expeditiously because people are waiting. And so... People are waiting you know, and I'm going to give a pitch to all all of our pharma friends, okay? In the United States, we have a ridiculously complicated relationship with patients in pharma. It's, it's, it's complicated. But the longer it takes to populate a study, the more money is burned and the more time is wasted. The more efficiently we can onboard patients to a clinical trial and get to answers. Even if the answer isn't, the one we want to get to, we need to get that answer. So we need to get to the, to the end of this game as quickly, as safely, and as effectively as possible. And that means teamwork. That means I'm going to make a commitment that I'm going to put this extra time of my life into this process 
for the next couple of months. And hopefully the community will benefit from that. It's the HCMA I have spoken to. I did in the numbers the other day, guys. It's gotten higher. I'm at 16,000 families that I've spoken to personally over 27 years. Wow. That's families. So in those families, there's multiply affected individuals. So if less than 1% of all the people that I've spent 27 years of my life serving and, and helping step up and be part of this clinical trial, less than 1% of them, we can get to an answer pretty quickly. So we're going to do what we can to make sure people understand where to get involved in a trial, how to communicate with their clinical trial coordinators, how to find out if they're the right patient or not. We're going to help you as much as we can. But you gotta, you got to answer the phone when they call. You've got to ask. You have to show up. If you're going to commit, make sure to the best of your knowledge and ability, we know things happen in life, that you can follow it through to the end. Because nothing is worse than putting all the time and money into bringing somebody in and then having them drop out in week seven because they didn't realize it was going to be this much time or life got in the way. You got to schedule your life around this. It's a major commitment. And we appreciate you for doing it. I've, I've done them. I've put myself out there and I'm asking others to do the same. What else do they need to know? I think I've said enough. I mean, it's this real, I mean, I guess the last thing I should say is thank you. You and Steve both said it before um to the patients who participated um so far and to the patients who are considering participating going forward um i would say again to, to anybody who's you know sort of listening or watching that the best thing you can do is to ask your provider about it you can go to uh, hcma and ask lisa about it you can ask your center of excellence about it um, and you'll get information um, Steve, is there any other resource that you would recommend for people who are interested in in one of our studies? Um, I mean, clinicaltrials.gov, which is kind of um, we just put a link to them on on, on the site. It's it's a little dry. A little dry, yeah. yeah, a little dry. But I mean, you know, you generally will have the number of sites that are active. Um, and you can you can see if there's a, a center close to where you live. Um, that I would say the majority of HCMA recognized centers of excellence are on that list, if not all of them, most of them. Um, so that's a good place for people to start. And that's part of the reason why we have the centers so that we can silo patients in an area where they can be participants in clinical trials. So it's ask your HCM center of excellence about the options for trials right now. There are multiple trials going on. Um, do I have a question about the non-obstructeds? Is there any role in Sequoia for non-obstructed or is it strictly obstructed? No, non-obstructed patients have the opportunity for the study that Steve talked about cohort four for Redwood. And in the future, I think um, I can speak confidently to the fact that we will be looking to another study for NHCM. Uh, Sorry. But it's not part of Sequoia. Sequoia is really focused on obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Understood. Okay. Um, I know I'm going to get this question if I haven't already. When is the plan to submit to the FDA? What's the timeline look like if we get through the next step? This is a Steve question. And Steve's on now. Okay. Okay. So I think... Um, the plan to submit to the FDA is contingent on, um, I guess, two, two main things. Uh, the first is completion of the Sequoia HCM study um, and then analysis of all of the uh, scientific information that we gather. Um, and that really is dependent on the recruitment rate. So that's what you were talking about, Lisa. The faster we can do this, the faster we can get to the analysis and the, and the results, and then um, hopefully it'll uh, end up being a, a wildly positive study. Um, so that's the one thing. Then the other thing is, um, which people don't really kind of think about, it's the kind of uh, the non-clinical aspects of what make up a FDA submission. And there are things in there like, you know, can you take uh, the drug with food? 
for example, simple things like that, or, you know, uh, does it uh, affect um, pregnancy in, 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 in animals? So there, there are some animal studies that are done to assess whether, uh, you, you know, uh, it's safe for, for pregnancy to, to some degree. Um, and those are um, pretty much prescribed by the, the FDA and other uh, countries. Um, so you need to have, for example, two year studies to see whether a drug that is, is approved by FDA causes a thing like it can, could potentially cause cancer. Um, you know, so these are kind of safety and toxicology and pharmacology studies that, that are ongoing in the background that you know, patients and, and people don't really know about. Um, so once we've done those and we've completed the study, the hope is that by 2023, we'll be able to um, uh, submit uh, for a new drug application to the FDA. Um, and then obviously there's this whole um, kind of period of, of working with the FDA to make sure that the results that we've submitted um, are uh, you know appropriate and uh, answer any questions with the FDA before they actually approve the drug, and that can take you know several months. So <clears throat> the hope would be populate the study, get that done by year end, in about a year's time, be able to be processing that submission as long as everything goes well, which we expect it will. A um, little bit of this, a little bit of that across yeah. my eyes, but I'd look silly. Um, and then in another year and a half plus, we would have another tool in the toolbox available for clinical utilization. That would be the hope. We have a lot of places to go before we get there. See, when I said I wanted to flash forward five years, I didn't want to skip all this stuff. I just want to see what the results are going to be. So I just want like a little time machine to see i'm just curious <laughs> so i think i know what i'm gonna see and i'm just excited and i want to get there so i think um we've all got a lot of work ahead of us to make all this happen um so part of me is really sad that you're you know not at centers and i can call you every day and say i'm sending you people and doing our thing but another part of me is really happy that you're where you are doing the work that you're doing on this whole bigger level for all patients, regardless of whether they get to see you guys clinically or not. So thank you for everything that you guys are doing. And thank you for taking the time today to come to explain it to the patients directly. Um, this is going to get uploaded to the podcast stratosphere, whatever you call the pod, podcast of your, um, it's going to be on, on social. We're going to put it in a number of sources as well as putting it up on the website so people can understand what the science is behind this and how they can get involved. And hopefully it'll encourage a few people to say, yep, I'm gonna do a clinical trial. That sounds good. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to sign off of Facebook now. Give me one second. Thank you everybody for listening to Tales from the Heart. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dan. And thank and you Lisa, for everything that you've been doing, not just today, but you know your, your entire professional life. So thanks so much. Oh, Absolutely. you're very, very welcome. Absolutely. And I, I've, I've known both of these guys. God, wait, how long have I known you guys? Since See, you were still in hair. Jersey when you called me before you went out there. So that's... It's about 12 years ago now. About 12 years ago. And probably Dan, I don't even remember. Yeah, probably 2009. Yeah. So it's been a long yeah. time. And so much has changed and so much more to do. But guys, thanks for everything. Have you enjoyed this episode of Tales from the Heart? We hope so. Please visit us at 4hcm.org. Become a member, become a donor, become a volunteer. Great news, everybody. HCM Academy is now available online. What is it? It includes online sessions, learning about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, patient stories about HCM and their management, and an opportunity to join online live with an HCM specialist to go over the slides, ask questions, and dig deeper into your understanding and knowledge of HCM. All CME courses are free, and you can find them at 4hcm.org or at thehcmacademy.com. The Big Hearted Warrior Tour continues. For the latest dates, please check 4hcm.org. And thanks to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, Invitae, and Austin Scientific. Did you know discussion groups are available 
at 4hcm.org. Monday through Friday, almost every day you can find a discussion group. Whether you're interested in learning more about ICDs, pre-myectomy, screening your family, there's a discussion group for you. Even if you just want to learn how to balance your mental health, we have that too. So please join us for one of our live discussion groups moderated by a peer volunteer and you can sign up in advance at 4hcm.org. Just check the calendar for events. Please contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association at 4hcm.org or by calling our office at 973-983-7429. You can contact the HCMA by email at support at 4hcm.org. Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the HCMA, is made possible through sponsorship from Boston Scientific, Cytokinetics, Tanaya, Invitae, and Boston Scientific.